I just also try that I can. Oh, yeah, it's all good. OK, good. <laughs> OK. So I'll just give, give you a little introduction. So uh, welcome, everyone. Welcome to the Center of International Law um, at uh, uh, Lancaster University's lunchtime speaker seminar series and uh, we're welcoming the uh, last speaker this term who's joining us, um, Katharina uh, Rogala von Bieberstein, um, who will, is coming from the International Centre for Antimicrobial Resistance or ICARS based in Copenhagen. So she's joining us uh, all the way from Copenhagen and uh, the connection is working beautifully, which we're very pleased about. Um, so Katharina will be talking about the establishment of the center and uh, how it's its role in tackling the silent pandemic of antimicrobial resistance, the resistance of, of, of basically bacteria to, to antibiotics and the particular significance of this for low and middle income countries who will be hardest hit by the growing resilience of bacteria to treatment. Uh, just a little uh, a little about, about Katharina. She has a master's from McGill and she's qualified as a German lawyer. She previously worked for uh, the United Nations Environmental Programme and also the German International uh, Development Agency, GIZ. Uh, she currently works uh, for uh, the International Centre for Antimicrobial Resistance and uh, she'll be talking then about uh, its establishment uh, and its role. So, uh, Katharina, over to you. Yeah, great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, and hello, everybody. Um, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be able to give this talk. Uh, thank you very much, James, uh, for inviting me. Um, yeah, and um, I would like to introduce uh, today um, uh, to you ICARS, uh, yeah, the International Center for Antimicrobial Resistance Solutions, um, which has been um, established uh, by the Danish um, government um, a few years back um, in order to tackle the so-called silent pandemic um, of antimicrobial resistance, solution, uh, resistance um, in low and middle income um, countries. Um, and my, yeah, so I joined ICAS pretty much a year ago um, and my role is um, to work on really a range of different legal subjects um, in relation to the, um, to the organizational um, transformation of ICAS. So first, just uh, briefly in a nutshell, um, what is, um, what is ICAS? Um, ICAS is an organization um, that works in partnership um, with governments in low and middle income countries um, to develop and test um, context specific um, solutions for AMR, antimicrobial resistance. Um, yeah, and as James already said, um, uh, AMR occurs, occurs when um, bacteria, viruses, fungi or parasites um, change over time um, and result um, develop the ability to resist um, the attack by specific drugs. Um, in other words, um, antibiotics or other antimicrobial um, medicines um, become ineffective and so infections become increasingly difficult or even impossible um, to treat. Um, in this context, you've probably heard of the term um, superbugs. Um, and these are strains of um, bacteria that have developed um, antibiotics. Um, that is, um, and that is, for example, for a bacteria that um, strain that causes um, multi drug resistant um, tuberculosis. Um, ICAS is an organization that importantly doesn't only provide funding. Um, but also expertise um, across the One Health sector, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. Um, we are initiated, uh, we're initiated by the De um, government of Denmark, we're for a while embedded even in the Danish Ministry of Health, and now since the end of last year um, have become an independent organization. Um, we um, mainly still, um, the core funding is still from the Danish government, um, but there is also um, funding from other states and foundations um, and it is the amb ambition that that will grow um, for that transformation, still the ambition to become an international organization. Um, 
Presently, we have 22 employees um, and um, with the offices are based in Copenhagen, Denmark, but we also have um, advisors um, or yeah, that, that are like staff, but from an employment perspective, they're consultants and that, um, uh, but they're part of the core team that are based um, in their respective um, countries. To turn these slides. Um, yeah, let's have a look at, um, uh, let's take a, a brief look at antimicrobial resistance um, and more specifically antibiotic resistance with the support of this infographic um, from the World Health Organization. Um, so the primary driver for AMR is uh, misuse, including um, overuse of antibiotics. And that refers to the practice that antibiotics are prescribed or simply taken um, too often or not according to, to, to best practice. Um, and when microorganisms are exposed um, to low levels of antibiotics that cannot actually neutralize them um, or when they are inappropriately used, these disease causing organisms and acquire the skill to resist this medicine in the future. Um, and another uh, uh, key driver is the lack of um, clean water and sanitation. In particular, that's, a, that's an issue in, uh, in hospitals, as well as, of course, generally infection prevention and control, um, which again promotes the, the spread of microbes and including the ones that are resistant to antimicrobial treatment. Um, and also other deficiencies in the health systems, in health systems um, affect the evolution of the problem. Um, for example, um, when access to, uh, to quality health care is poor in certain regions, um, informal um, health care providers will take over that role um, and often they don't have um, the right, uh, a good medical training to um, prescribe um, antibiotics. Um, appropriately. Um, and also if there is a, a lack of a system um, to monitor the sales of antibiotics or an audit system to look at the quality at the prescriptions given out by doctors, then also this um, has uh, research has so shown leads to um, heavy uh, misuse in antibiotics. Um, and very importantly, um, antibiotics or the drivers of antimicrobial resistance are not only present in the human health sector, but, but uh, uh, very much so also in the environmental and, um, uh, and animal health sectors. Um, so a um, large amount of medically important antibiotics um, are used um, in particular in uh, food animal production um, for a long time also as, as growth promoters, or I say for a long time, still today in many countries um, as growth promoters or just as a precaution for disease, but not just for treating diseases. Um, and um, yeah, and through that a lot of um, uh, bacteria um, and uh, resistant bacteria ends up in our food, um, the environment, um, soil and water, or, is, um, or these bacteria of course also transmitted by, by direct um, human animal. Um, contact. Yeah, so it's. Um, yeah, so we need to. Yeah, I'm a bit too quick here. <laughs> so we really need to um, to safeguard um, antibiotics um, for the use in both um, uh, animals and humans to ensure um, that um, effective treatment is of, of infections is still possible in the future. And um, what is also interesting is that um, um, you would think then when more and more antibiotics are rendered ineffective due to AMR, um, that there is more, um, uh, more antibiotics being developed or alternatives um, being developed that can tackle um, those diseases, but that's actually not the case. So that's one of the things where, um, where uh, yeah, uh, due to uh, pure uh, or poor return and investment in antibiotics research and development, this is really a good gap, which which it's basically impossible to catch up on. So there have been um, initiatives um, uh, over the last years to 
uh, or decades even to provide incentives, but, but they are far from uh, um, sufficient to actually um, tackle this, this big uh, problem. Um, and also just some thoughts um, uh, with regard to the coronavirus disease and, um, and AMR. Um, there are um, lots of concerns, of course, data is, you know, uh, we will know for sure in some time, but there is um, lots of indications um, that um, the coronavirus pandemic ex exacerbated the problem. There have been studies, for example, conducted in the US where it was shown how many antibiotics were given to um, two patients, um, two COVID-19 patients, even before um, a bacterial um, infection was even confirmed. Um, and of course, also the pandemic um, diverted much of attention and resources away from the topic because simply health agencies, health ministries thought there's this more urgent um, issue to tackle. Um, on the other hand, I guess you can also say it, um, awareness was, was, was rising and maybe Maybe it even in a way helped to make that very abstract fear of AMR to many still abstract to many not so abstract um, more tangible and maybe through that also more uh, um, hopefully um, and will provide um, more of an, uh, of an effort to really to really uh, tackle um, tackle AMR. Um, and also, of course, the the importance of um, of global of global collaboration to tackle such a global uh, a crisis of global scale. Um, yeah, and the emergence of um, of more and more um, strains of um, bacteria that that can't be effectively treated by by existing antibiotics um, is a major health risk. Um, as we know, is the pandemic. Uh, it doesn't know any uh, bacteria, don't know any borders or respect any uh, boundaries um, around countries or regions. Um, and um, yeah, it's really not to be underestimated what it would mean or what it means um, um, if we don't have um, effective antimicrobials um, in the future. Um, antibiotics really transformed um, the health systems or what, what we, uh, which uh, challenges with health challenges um, 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 the human um, population could tackle and that's not specific diseases only but also just what it means to undergo major surgery or, or chemotherapy. Um, so it would really be a huge drawback in terms of what we regard as as, um, as yeah normal when when we today go to to, to hospitals. Um, and it was, of course, in particular, it started all with the discovery of penicillin already in 1928. Um, and um, yeah, so to, to, to really say bland, if, if we don't find a solution, then what we consider today minor infections um, could mean um, death um, again, um, like they used to do prior through the broad um, availability of, of antibiotics. Um, and now let's have a look at the um, at the numbers. Um, there is um, a very uh, new and recent um, estimates on the burden of AMR around the world. Um, this um, was um, published um, in the Lancet, um, one of the leading, if not the leading, independent um, general medical journals um, at the beginning of this year. Um, yeah, and the, the, it's the most comprehensive study that was that was ever done on the topic um, in the form of a systematic analysis. Um, and it really made and we just had an internal uh, like a deep dive last week from somebody involved in the study. It, it really involved a huge effort of getting data from many different sources around the world. And in this in this sense is, is really um, um, unique and, and useful. Um, and the study was uh, led by the Global Research on Antimicrobial Resistance uh, Project, which is a flagship project between the University of Oxford, uh, Big Data Institute, and the Institute for Health Metric and Evaluation um, at, uh, in the US. Um, and yeah, a key finding is that in 2019, bacterial um, AMR contributed to the deaths of 1.27 million people, um, and to an estimated uh, 4.95 million deaths. 
um, that were associated uh, with IMR. And that really means um, that, um, that the death rate is higher than the one from HIV or from malaria. Um, and it also, one of the findings is also that one in five deaths caused by AMR were in children under five. Um, and it confirmed that most, they have most, the highest burden is felt in low and middle income countries um, and Sub-Saharan Africa has the highest death rate um, attributable to drug resistance infections. Um, and very yeah, useful and, and about this study is also that it's not just the big numbers and global, but really this this breakdown per regions and also it includes breakdowns um, per infections. For example, it concluded that lower respiratory infections um, accounted for more than um, 1.5 million deaths and therefore it's it's um, considered um, the most burdensome infectious syndrome. Just on a side note, that's also an infection that was often uh, caused by the coronavirus. And there are three um, infectious syndromes that dominate uh, the global burden attributable to and associated to AMR. And these are yeah, the lower respiratory infections, bloodstream infections and intra-abdominal infections. And combined, these account for 78.8% uh, of all deaths attributable to AMR. Um, and it's important to stress that because um, uh, AMR burdens are caused by both the, the prevalence of resistance, but also, of course, the underlying frequency of these um, of these um, critical um, infections. Um, and um, and yeah, if if we look at um, poor poor resource um, settings. Um, and the strain that health systems face in these regions. Um, uh, often the fact that no access um, to antibiotics can even be far more deadly um, than, than resistance. So it's not only about antimicrobial resistance, but also access to, to, to antibiotics and um, access to the, to the right and, and effective antibiotic. Um, and so the study also really make the point that um, the need for context specific interventions when trying to tackle um, uh, interventions um, in different countries and regions. And not surprisingly, um, of course, the study also re um, uh, revealed a big a data gap in, uh, in particular low income um, settings, which of course is also key to to um, to uh, uh, to have um, effective interventions um, and to thus the need to expand on a microbiology laboratory um, capacities and collection systems. So why ICAS? Um, the, why was ICAS initiated? Um, the threat um, um, of AMR has been known really for a long time. Um, and it also gained um, increased attention over the last decades, including, of course, at the global policy level. Um, so in um, 2015, the World Health Organization, um, in collaboration uh, with the World Animal Health Organization, OIE, and the Food and Agri Agricultural um, Organization, FAO, um, they, uh, they adopted a, a global plan um, to tackle AMR and that also um, resulted in the establishment of an interagency coordination group um, and the three organizations support this interagency co uh, coordination group um, through the so-called tripartite collaboration, uh, which was recently also used and um, joined by the UN Environment Programme, now called Tripartite Plus, <laughs> so <laughs> not quite on equal footing. And as with so many other global plans um, adapted to, to to tackle certain challenges. The, the key mechanisms for implementation at the national level is the national um, action plans um, on AMR. Um, another key, or, but one of the really key reports in the last years that, um, that was instrumental for global awareness and action was the 2016 O'Neill Review. That was an independent um, study um, commissioned by the UK government and the Wellcome Trust. Um, and um, it estimated that over 700,000 people died in 2016 
um, due to antimicrobial resistance and um, projected this to rise to 10 million in 2050. And until this new Lancet studies, this was the figure that that everybody referred to when when working on AMR. Um, but this is really a new step. This was this general number, but people always could still say, but what does it mean for Benin or France or whatever? So this, first of all, new figures that look even more, even worse, <laughs> um, as well as this, this regional breakdown. And then we also had a, a very important um, report by the World Bank um, in 2017. Um, and that predicted that the um, econ uh, yeah, looked at the economic impact, of course, and predicted that it will be bigger than the financial crisis of 2008, 2009, because it will last longer. Uh, it's already started, of course, and it will increase the inequalities also between uh, uh, countries and because it impacts low and in middle income countries um, the most. Um, and a key finding of that report, as well as also other policy reviews um, um, from, from the UN system, really see that the importance for implement support to implementation on the ground. And that is, of course, lack of resources, money, but really not only money, um, also really support in, 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 in capacity building and guidance uh, on how actually to do it, how to translate this global uh, this this global problem um, at the local level. Um, and it also said that even if there's much evidence on effective interventions to mitigate AMR, it's either not applicable in the context of low and middle income countries, or it has not been implemented for various reasons. But key conclusion, there is a, a lack of sufficient knowledge on how to effectively mitigate AMR, in particular in low and middle income countries, where which in addition are of course hit the worst by 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 this uh, Krales crisis. And to address this shortcoming, it was um, that ICAS was initiated. Um, it was established with the mission to support low and middle income countries in um, in develop um, in developing evidence based um, and cost effective um, solutions to AMR. So. Um, and implementing this mission, we do this by providing funding, expertise and support um, to what it is framed intervention and implementation research projects. Um, and key characteristics of those are that they have to be um, evidence based, context specific and context specific and cost effective. Um, and of course, um, the aim is that they are that sustainable um, solutions are developed that use the One Health lens um, and that lead to behavioral change so that it's really not just one of projects, but but that um, sustainability and and in particular also scale up um, is is triggered. So what distinguishes ICAST from the other players that are already out there? Um, um, we describe it as a mix between top down and bottom up approach. And that means firstly, we work with um, top down at the ministerial level, and that's our entry point um, with, uh, with the different countries. And that is to se um, secure political commitment and eventually the, the scale up um, of research projects in alignment with countries' national action plans. Um, at the same time, um, we work bottom up and um, that of course, with the aim that projects are locally owned and rooted in scientific um, research conducted by res uh, local research institutions. Um, so building on existing evidence and, um, and programs and engaging with relevant local stakeholders. Um, and we, of course, as I already said, there are obviously already many players out there. We, we for sure don't want to just work on our own, but, but um, but um, complement um, um, uh, this um, existing expertise and, and uh, infrastructure that's already out there. So we're very keen and we already do that. We partner with a lot of other organizations um, and programs and have, for example, engaged uh, with organizations like REACT, ILRI, the World Health Organization, the Fleming Fund, just to name a few. Um, but the starting point for all our projects is really the National Action Plan. And based on that, three times a year, 
countries can express their um, yeah their interest through through an expression of interest, <laughs> um, and that's then when 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 the discussion starts, um, and. Our aim is really that it's it's country led, so it's the country that sets based on their um, national action plan the priorities. Um, but often in practice, there's still a prioritization exercise where we say we we support or guide them if need be, because um, yeah, because again, there seems to be often many different areas where support is needed, and also the prioritization in itself requires um, um, requires um, good 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 awareness, good knowledge. Um, and um, so we help um, uh, countries, we guide them um, to, to focus on certain issues, where to start. We help them in connecting with experts. And that's why we talk about co-development and eventually co-implementation of our projects. So it's not that they come with a great project, we fund it and then off they, off they go, but um, we co-develop it together with them and co-implement it. And so that's what's one of the things that we regard as unique to our approach, this, this coupling of funding and expertise. Um, and that also means that it's not always the most obvious, biggest AMR issue that we are tackling, but it's really about seeing what um, maybe also just low hanging fruits, if they even exist, um, because there's a lot of time um, it's about changing processes and often not so clear, you know, global benefit as with so many other things, <laughs> climate change, nice to have, but what does it mean locally? So, um, and locally it can produce, you know, they can create fears of, of, of changing processes, ensuring that all stakeholders are on board. Um, so our director of science likes to put it in. He likes to say understanding one health in a practical way. That's always what he says. So also really focusing on the social science and behavioral change. Um, and we actually call our current projects with countries demonstration projects um, where we test solution that can be scaled up. So it's it's rather small scale. Uh, but from the start, this idea of if it works, um, um, how it will be scaled up. And often that's where it's connected just to the policy framework. So in some countries, laws have been adopted to phase out certain antibiotics, but the country also knows, well, we have to work with our industry to make that happen, to support them through this to this transition. Um, and in the context of this uh, prioritization of, of interventions, I would like to more once uh, I would like to once more help the Lancet paper uh, Lancet. I don't know even how I pronounce it correctly, <laughs> um, but that was really um, yeah uh, a, a great. Also from that perspective, I mentioned it before because it has this regional breakdown um, and even at the regional breakdown of partly country level, not just big numbers, uh, uh, general numbers, but then it looks at specific uh, pathogens, it looks at specific antibiotics, pathogen combinations, and therefore also empowers uh, decision makers as well as health practitioners at the local level to in this prioritization task. So it really, um, uh, we think, can serve a, a, a big uh, yeah, big goal. Even as a yeah, a fantastic to see for a, for a, for a research paper. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, okay. So uh, yeah, let's have a, a closer look at the at the history of ICAS. I also have to say, so I'm, I'm I always had a, a big interest in history. So that was also the the things that intrigued me most when I joined here. I you know read some little paragraphs on the websites, but I really wanted to know. <laughs> Why did this happen? Why, why did the Danish government do this and why in the current form? Um, so it was really something that I talked to a number of colleagues since I joined, in particular, of course, the ones that have been um, on board from the start. And since it's such a young organization that really were instrumental in, in making ICAS um, happen. Um, and uh, yeah, I said before, it was initiated a few years ago by the Danish government. Uh, and that was after dialogues um, with uh, World Bank people. <laughs> and I'm just saying people because the very interesting point about this is while the while the trigger from the the, the World Bank um, staff to to have these conversations was really that World Bank report. Um, 
it's not that there was a specific recommendation in that report that you know ICAS is missing or an organization with the tasks of ICAS, but it just sort of identified the problem and then knowing now something will need to happen. And 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 people who were involved in this study, um, yeah, I guess I guess were determined, <laughs> and uh, and and maybe beyond what was formally possible. I don't know. Like it's not that I did a big research project. It's really I'm basing all this on the conversations that I had with people. Um, uh, yeah, but really started uh, started uh, in in talking to to potential countries that might be interested in in taking this up. So. The meeting that it was um, first introduced to the Danish government wasn't one that was formally set up for that purpose. It was just sort of a general meeting, mostly even focusing on other uh, topics. But this topic was also brought up. We don't know. I, I don't think people I, I talked to know either whether it has also been balanced with other governments. Um, so it was really down to the to the people that were involved in this conversation um to drive it and of course Denmark wasn't a random choice um so um Denmark is one of the countries that is internationally at the forefront when it comes to the low use of antibiotics um in particular in food producing animals and again on a side note while well, a small population of six millions I forgot how many pigs they have here but it's one of the world's largest uh, uh, a pig meat exporter. <laughs> so that was also certainly a need, I think, to to become <laughs> to come to the forefront. <laughs> and um, and so from the ICA side, the the person that was really a key driver today, he's a he's a senior consultant, is Per Henriksen, and he was the former chief veterinary officer of Denmark. So he had certainly the expertise. He had the level of seniority also probably needed to push um, to push this um, in the context of the Danish government um, and how he and what he told me had a little anecdote for me which I really liked um, he said one evening when he sat together with some of these other people um, and over a glass of beer they had the very big question of um, you know what uh, if one uh, what world will we leave our children and grandchildren behind and one day my grandchildren might ask me so if you knew about this all along what did you do <laughs> so I think that gave him really the the drive um, to 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 make this happen and of course again it was Denmark with that um, you know being also something what made sense from them internationally to maybe invest in, of course, also a country um, uh, with uh, with the resources um, to do so. But I thought that was actually a very, very interesting start for an organization. And that was sort of the initial, let's drive it. Um, but then the question, so what, what exactly, what kind of organization do we need exactly? And that's also quite interesting that it wasn't even clear that Denmark was going to do it. There were discussions maybe as part of the SIGA Family Research Institute. I don't think at a very concrete level, but there was just sort of brainstorming with different stakeholders. And then two different workshops where, where, um, uh, where a range of experts were involved um, to further sort of define the organization that is needed. Um, and so that concept note, I thought that was also interesting. I also had some um, insights there that even the initial stages, um, in particular, some people who, who, who were uh, invited for review uh, were not so pleased with the first version, said it way too much had a developed country perspective. Um, but they were at the same time very taken by this spirit of we really want to learn, we really want to make this um, as, as useful as possible. And then some of these people who criticized the initial draft are now on board as part of the, the ICAS team um, because they, they, they said it, it shaped in the right way through these very responsive um, consultations. Um, yeah, still interesting for me. I'll come back to that. And that's probably also something for our discussion after this ambition to make an international organization, but to start national. So when I joined, I was all of a sudden employed by the Danish Ministry of Health. I would have never believed that. <laughs> so, so because that was the for some reasons, I guess, administratively the easiest um, place to start. Um, and now, since the end of last year, we are independent um, organization under Danish law, under the supervision of the Danish Ministry of Health. Um, and um, yeah, I have on the next slide um, also the, the governance um, structure. So um, yeah, so ICONS is now an independent organization with an international 
board um, of directors as our um, supreme governing body. Um, they, of course, now hold the strategic and financial um, responsibility for ICAS and oversee all our activities. Um, and the daily operations and management of ICAS falls under the um, responsibility of the ICAS management. So far, director of operation and director um, are, uh, of research and the executive director position will be will be filled um, this year. So we hear just a glimpse of our our board also with the ambition really to 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 be acknowledged as an international um, organization and also linking to to experts in the field. So this close, even if not formally, there is a close ties in a way to the International Livestock Research Institute, one of the research institutes of the Seagar family, for example. Um, yeah, and then, um, yeah, but but still, as before, the ambition is to make um, to make uh, to make it an a, a, a proper, not just international operating, <laughs> but internationally steered and controlled organization. And so the, the ambition of ICAS and the Danish government, who is uh, the, 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 the key funder at this point, is to get other countries and foundations to join the board um, alongside um, um, Denmark um, to, um, yeah, to achieve the vision um, and strategic goals for ICAS. Um, and um, so foreseen is at the end of 2022 and a formal evaluation, but already um, before that um, countries, <laughs> countries have been invited um, uh, to join the organization, either as strategic funding partners, meaning already they will have a seat at the board um, or in particular also aimed at low and middle income countries who, who might lack the resources. There's a different form for them to be involved and have an influence um, through the strategic advisory forum and through regional uh, and meetings. Um, yeah, I, I, as always, I was longer than it was, so maybe I just strategic plan. I might skip that, but just give a flavor of the kind of projects. There's a nicer map now, but it's, I, I didn't manage to include it in this slide, but just to get an idea where our projects are today. And um, one very concrete, concrete example is, for example, the work on phasing out of a specific um, uh, antibiotic colistin in the pig production in Vietnam. And Vietnam were the projects that started last year. So the first two projects. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip now a bit to not. Yeah, but still here, the, the supporting project activities are also very important. I mentioned them before. So we have the demonstration projects with countries, but we also reach out to other partners and then we call them supporting projects because it's all focused on supporting and um, implementation um, in uh, uh, and the, the projects in countries. Um, and that includes, for example, um, oh, I already have it here to the very right um, work with the International Livestock Research Institute to build up antimicrobial susceptibility testing centers. So that can then um, support capacity building in the region, including capacity building um, in the countries uh, where we have our, our research um, projects. So, um, yeah, as the fifth pillar of our strategic a plan we have the the support uh, the build up of the new uh, of the international organization um, and they're just the very glimpse of what the activities that it actually meant so in the first phase it was really about preparing the legal framework and government um, structure um, um, for ICAS um, including yeah and including you know the the the, the drafting of, of grant agreements um, key policies that we need to have. And now the focus is on implementing all our policies, implementing our projects, further co-developing and co-implementing, and all with this side of, of, uh, of, yeah, basically making a starting point for then other um, uh, countries to join and uh, making, uh, uh, yeah, and, and further expanding actually our, our possibilities. 
so this is the slide I want to finish on and sort of some some personal um, reflection on ICAST that I think can can um, can trigger some thought for our our discussion and exchange. So the first one here, I call it Danish startup, and of course that's not in a very formal way, um, but I I somehow when I prepared for this presentation like the term because to me the start is really down to to motivation and determination um, at the at the individual level and also in a way to make it work quickly. And I think that was maybe almost the idea of then Denmark. Let's change. Let's just do it. Let's start with something. We have so many international organizations, but we in a way need to have a proof of concept and admit maybe a bit beyond that. <laughs> um, uh, and then others can just can just join and, and jump on the boat. Um, yeah, transition number two, what we are right now in, to me, it doesn't feel so much like a transition because we have more and more projects. We have an international board, <laughs> um, so um, it actually still feels very much like this transition is a big thing, of course, in itself because it's uh, just already a bigger organization that is up and running, has more projects, needs to implement all its, all its policies. Um, um, but of course, at the same time, and that is where then we see that it's a transition. There is this big move towards getting other countries and foundations, interestingly, um, to join um, as either strategic funding partners, funding partners um, or, or mission partners. So the format, what ICAS will look like, is not decided yet. There will be a final evaluation, but that's Danish government. So of course, also if new members join, then of course it's uh, it's also up to them um, and coming together and and deciding on what the best structure and governing structure um, for ICAS will be moving forward. Thank you very much, and sorry for going over. <laughs> Not at all, not at all, Katharina. Um, you, you're actually pretty much on time. I was just sort of, I, was, I, knew, I knew, you know, it wasn't sort of stop now. But thank you very much for an excellent presentation. I mean, really, really, really interesting, and I think a lot of lot of issues to discuss. So everyone um, uh, who's who's uh, attending through the link, you can ask uh, pose questions to Katharina um, now. If you go to the little icon. On the, which should be on your top right hand corner of your screen, you can see a little uh, a question mark in a speech bubble, and that is the Q and A icon. And if you uh, if you click on that, you can uh, pose questions to uh, Katharina. Um, Alexandra, you can you can just uh, unmute your microphone, and that should work uh, just just as well. Um, perhaps I could just pose one question to uh, to sort of start off. I mean, you. you Talk about an organization that is perhaps at a, at a crossroads in terms of how it wants to develop. Um, and organizations have, of course, moved from being an NGO to an intergovernmental organization. The World Tourism Organization uh, is, is an example of that. Do you, do you think, though, that there, there are pro possible risks maybe in becoming an intergovernmental organization that you might then become, your work might then become more sort of a politicized, more sort of, you know, Sub, sub, uh, dictated by states' interests? Are there other risks or what would be the risks and benefits of, of that approach? Yeah, so so the benefit is clearly the money. Um, I think uh, Denmark is, is uh, you know, regards itself probably and from certain sector is quite generous, <laughs> um, but they sort of said if this is supposed to be global and in so many countries and they have now even committed funding until 26, but under certain conditions of us getting additional funding. Um, so that is one of the things that it might help other countries to, uh, yeah, yeah, get more funding. Um, yeah, of course I do see risks. I guess it's always when more players um, are involved, but I do also think from the current governance setup um, and also from the idea of the board that there's still a lot uh, uh, room for expert directions by, by experts. And so there's already a big effort to have a global representation um, of experts there and through that have it not too polarized by politics. Um, I think also because it's uh, uh, it's it's really. Yeah. 
projects on the ground with researchers, but still you have the link to different ministries. So there will always be a political element. Um, and that is also good so because again for um, for triggering um, a bigger and sustainable change that is the that is the general approach also by ICAS. Um, yeah, but it is an interesting thought because I also think you could also wonder are there certain risks? You know, right now we don't want to be perceived as too Danish either, right? So because otherwise countries might think ah. Denmark has it in its grip. So um, what can we actually and how far can we influence it sufficiently? Why don't we just fund what we have for now? We have other countries that fund specific um, projects then often in their regions or in their in their area of interest. Um, yeah, but I think a key thing is this sustainability in in the funding, hopefully, although knowing other international organizations, they also then struggle running after the money. So, yeah, good question. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, yeah, but I but I think from how it's set up now, I, I, I really hope it can. Yeah, sort of alleviate concerns, but right now we have the feeling that everybody is waiting for somebody else. So of course, COVID also stalled it. There was um, for good reasons because our key partner is uh, are the Ministry of Health, and obviously we didn't really expect them in many countries to be too responsive um, during that crisis because of other priorities. But still, we sort of have the feeling it's now a question of yeah, it's a you know, it's a it's a funny. It's a funny situation I sometimes find. There's many good in, in, in discussions. Uh, ICAS gets more and more attention um, in different forums, scientific as well as um, a policy level. Um, but it's a bit sort of everybody is sort of testing and probably wondering. And I sometimes wonder if everybody will, will, waits for somebody to move and then it might trigger something. With, and there is different. I sometimes also like there was this initial ambition, but if you said maybe it, it works way in another form, and it will just stay this this Danish organization with lots of international support and projects, and maybe it turns out that works just as fine. Um, yeah. I mean, is there? Is, I mean, I think you've made the point that there is this sort of danger that it is seen as. I mean, Denmark is a very much a first world country, and that it then becomes seen as something that's done to other peoples. I think. Yeah, but I think that was really something that was where the where that risk was seen in the very beginning with these mm, first yeah. concepts, but I think because it had such a strong focus, so you already see it through uh, yeah, our board, but also really our staff. Um, and um, I wasn't, of course, able to see it in the, in the very beginning, but the more the longer I work here, I see how we also managed to get so many of the global experts, so really from all the different regions of the world, um, either uh, joining us as consultants, as staff um, on the board um, and in influential positions. So I don't think it is felt that uh, that it's in any way Denmark driving driving um, the agenda. Yeah, I'm just I think that was actually quite successful in, in alleviating those concerns. Right. Yeah, uh, again, just to call out to anyone, if you yeah. like to pose a question, um, please, uh, please just uh, type it in the, the Q&A box. Uh, I haven't got any any new ones at the moment? Um, so uh, Can I jump in with one. Yeah, sure. Uh, so I was really curious, Katharina, because you're looking at it obviously from trying to build an organization and the, you know, the the legal and the governance aspects of it. How have you found trying to incorporate all of the different scientific elements that you need? Because obviously it's it's such a niche area, it's so nuanced. Um, that you will need to have a lot of scientific voices that mm -hmm. might not be familiar with legal community and legal standards for international organizations, et cetera, and vice versa. Um, so how has that gone? So I'm not sure if I <laughs> if I know exactly the focus of the question. Can you maybe elaborate a bit further? No, so, of course. so, so maybe just, you know, how, how as you've been developing this, how have you been able to kind of bridge between law and science and governance concepts and science to structure an organization that will work as an international organization, but also allow a lot of the scientific knowledge and background to come in uh, mm -hmm. when it's very hard often for scientists to understand how to frame things in a legal context. 
Yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. Well, I think that's an on an ongoing and sometimes I feel never ending challenge. <laughs> so it's it's and it's quite interesting for me. So prior when I worked at UNIF WCMC and I was more on the project implementation side, and now I'm part of the the operations team. Um, and we sometimes have some some things where we laugh about. We just had a workshop this morning with the uh, yeah with all ICAS, and then all of a sudden our di uh, research director said our two teams, uh, our one team with the different. You know? <laughs> so so there is always this research just quickly wanting to do their research and implementing the projects, um, um, and not always so easy to. To communicate, um, um, uh, yeah, the, the need and uh, the need for, and also the benefits of all these uh, legal processes that needs to be in place and the structure. So it is, a, I think, a very interesting task that um, um, that yeah is, I think, one of the the key joys of such an organization uh, that that also wants to 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 uh, to bridge the science policy gap. <laughs> Yeah, if that, if that, I hope that answers your question a little oh, bit. Oh, absolutely. No, it definitely does. <laughs> yeah. it, it, just as I was listening to this, I yeah. had this image in yeah. my head of trying to, to yeah. have everyone understand each other, and it was quite yeah. difficult. So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I think we're almost out of time. Um, I don't see any questions from the attendees at the moment. <laughs> uh, this is the last chance to, 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 to pose a question. Can also always follow up with me later in case yes. you're interested. Yes. We also have some positions advertised uh, in my lovely team, so <laughs> check it out. <laughs> okay, I think uh, I think we're, we're all almost out of time now, so I think we'll have to have to leave it there. Um, thank you very much, uh, Katharina, for for really an excellent talk and and uh, for highlighting what is. Um, a massive health issue, as you as you say, you know, this is now bigger than HIV um, and malaria, which are both enormous killers mm -hmm. and enormous problems in 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 throughout the world. So this is this is the sort of ongoing big big health health crisis, and and it's so good to hear, um, you know, about the, all the work that you're you're doing and all the work that um, ICARS is doing. And as I said, uh, you know, I think a fascinating subject going forward and pro possibly something for a research paper, um, you know, later on. I'm so, sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but thank you. Thank you once again. Um, and uh, and um, no, no, no more questions. So th thank you. Thank Great. you very much. And, Great. Thank uh, you so much, James. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> OK, <laughs> bye. <laughs>